We are continuing our series in the book of Exodus. Today I will be reading Exodus chapter 5. As you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word as a sign of his authority over us. Exodus chapter 5. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens? The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it, and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you may find, can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday, as in the past? Then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle, you are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks." The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task, each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. This is God's word. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, My name is Scott. It's a privilege to get to be in God's word with you this morning. Um, I am married. Uh, My wife, Anchang, is out of town this weekend, uh, up in Michigan, Uh, about... Twenty-some years ago, uh, we were driving up to Michigan for a different thing. We served on staff with crew and had a summer mission uh, that we were headed up to in Traverse City. And the day that we were driving up to Michigan happened to be her birthday. And I thought I should try to do something that would be like maybe road trip themed for her birthday present. Um, And it had been a very busy season leading up. We were helping to lead that summer mission. So life had felt very hectic. And uh, I ended up getting her two things that I thought she would enjoy on a long road trip. One was a a magazine that she liked to read. She often would read a magazine on a road trip. And a a new Celine Dion CD. Uh, So, you know, this is 20 years ago, mind you. So that was cool at the moment. Um, All of which seemed like a very reasonable thing to do with kind of not a lot of extra time on my hands and and this road trip that we were going on. So we're in the car, we're driving, and I kind of pull it from beneath the chair and, you know, think that she's going to be, oh, how how fun, little road trip things for me. All of it seemed very reasonable to me. In hindsight, um, not a stellar birthday gift, Uh, especially 
once I tell you that it was her 30th birthday, and I just didn't really know that birthdays divisible by 10 were really big. Like when I turned 10, it was just another birthday and 20 was no big deal. But starting at 30, those ones with zeros at the end really matter. And I really blew it. Uh, she was appreciative that I had gotten her those things, but she was also pretty disappointed in the level of thoughtfulness that I had put into the gift. Um, in my planning, it had all seemed very reasonable. Uh, and we're gonna take some time to look at this story from three different perspectives. And all of the people do what seem very reasonable to them, much like my gift was reasonable in my mind. Um, but, it, but it wasn't. And so just a little heads up, if, if you're less than 30 and you don't know that those 30, 40, 50 birthdays are big deals, um, they are. Uh, bonus lesson. Well, to help us understand our story, I, I do, like I said, want to take a look at it from the perspective of the three main characters or, or group of characters. First, uh, we're going to think about the events of this story from Pharaoh's point of view. Then we're going to look at it from the point of view of the Israelites, kind of as a, as a group of people. Finally, we'll get into the minds of Moses and Aaron. But really, for simplicity's sake, I'll probably mostly just say Moses, even though Aaron is with him through it all. Once we get a really good handle on the story and kind of how it lands for each one of them, we'll take some time to think about how it connects with us. Let me pray. God, I do ask for your mercy. Uh, let the message of this passage sink into our hearts and change us by your spirit, by your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Pharaoh is the political leader of a mighty nation. But for us to understand his perspective, we need to realize that his role in Egypt went way beyond that. One of the titles that the Pharaoh of Egypt held was high priest of every temple. You see, Pharaoh was more than just a civil leader. He was a religious one as well. For his people, Pharaoh was an intermediary between them and the gods. But it didn't stop there. The people of Egypt, like the people in many ancient Near East cultures, viewed their leader, viewed the Pharaoh as a god himself. He had the status of divinity. He was a god on earth. So when this new spokesman shows up on the scene for the Hebrew slaves named Moses, and he shows up and says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh's rejection makes sense from both a religious and a civil perspective. As a political ruler, letting all of the slave labor you have go free makes zero sense. There's no way in the world that Pharaoh is just going to let roughly two million slaves just go free. Why would you do that? I know the official ask here is for a worship retreat, uh, but Moses knows and Pharaoh knows and everybody knows what's really going on here. I was a little confused by that at first. Um, one of the commentaries I read said that this was a pretty common negotiation technique at that time where you ask for one thing even though everybody knows you're actually asking for something else. All that to say, uh, the economic realities alone would have made this a total non-starter for Pharaoh and for Egypt as a whole to let them go. Add to that the fact that Pharaoh is the high priest of Egypt. He can't abase himself to this foreign god, certainly not the god of the slaves. So his reply to Moses makes perfect sense. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. Moreover, 
I won't let people go. He basically says, why should I listen to your God? (laughs) No way. Not going to happen. Pharaoh then decides that his slaves are getting a little too comfortable. He decides to make their load harder. Three motives make a lot of sense to me here. Uh, The first is punitive. I think he's wanting to punish them. He's angry at this request. And so he wants to punish the slaves for even suggesting that they be set free. Second, if he ups the workload, they're not even having the energy to think about leaving. You, You can't organize a rebellion if you are so exhausted at the end of your day that all you can do is collapse in your bed and go to sleep. Lastly, I think Pharaoh understands human psychology and he recognizes that he has an opportunity to drive a wedge between the people and their new spokesman, Moses and Aaron. So that's what he does. He takes away the supply of straw, uh, which is one of the main ingredients that they needed to make the bricks that they were required to make, but orders that they have no reduction in their brick production. Keep it up, do the same number of bricks, but I'm not giving you any straw. It'd be like working at a pillow factory, and one day the boss comes in and he's upset with the workers, so he says, all right, you gotta make the same number of pillows, but now you gotta find your own stuffing. Go out, find it, make it, but keep up with all the pillows that you've been making every day. You, you would, as a worker, you would be just looking at me, that I can't do that. That's, that's unreasonable. It was an impossible task. But that's the point. He wants them to work to exhaustion and then beat them for making fewer bricks. If you're Pharaoh, every part of this story so far makes sense. Except maybe the fact that Moses would even come up with the crazy idea of asking to let their people go. Because Pharaoh doesn't know or trust the God of Israel, he does what seems reasonable to him. He makes the self-protective choice in the moment to keep his enslaved workforce. What other choice does he have? Let's make a shift and think about this story from the Israelites' perspective now. They've spent their whole lives as slaves in Egypt. They were born into slavery, just like their parents and their parents before them. And they've most certainly grown up hearing the stories about Abraham and Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. They know about the promised land. And for that to become a reality, they'll obviously have to escape slavery at some point and get out of Egypt. But all they've ever known is taskmasters and foremen and slavery. Day to day, I suspect they weren't living with a whole lot of hope or expectation for tomorrow. And then old Moses shows up, scrambling up out of the wilderness with tales of burning bushes and a promise that they're about to be set free. Sounds like maybe he spent too much time in the desert with the sheep, cooking his brain a little bit. Like that just sounds crazy, right? But then he throws his staff on the ground and it turns into a snake. And then he grabs the tail of it and it turns back into a stick. That got everybody's attention. And then he sticks his arm in his robe and he pulls it out and it's full of leprosy and he before anybody can like take off, he sticks it back in and pulls it out and it's, it's well again. Well, after that, a whole lot of people started to believe him. But then he, he takes some river water and he pours it out and it turns into blood right in front of their eyes. And he's got everybody. He's got it all. Everybody knew They were about to go home, the promised land, a land of abundance, milk and honey and freedom, no more whips, no more bricks. 
Hope was overflowing like the Nile does in summer. So when Moses goes to meet with Pharaoh, people have already got their bags packed in their minds. They're counting down the days. We're leaving. We're going home. But then, instead of getting a pass, Pharaoh gives them a greater burden. It's not a lighter load they get. It's a heavier load. It's bad before, but now they're like a skunk in Pharaoh's nose. He is so mad. That reversal must have been devastating. Moses had given a despondent people a glimmer of hope, and now Pharaoh has dashed it to pieces. Now instead of packing their bags to leave, they're using those bags to fill it with any kind of stubble they can find out in the wilderness to use as the straw that used to be just provided for them. They're working harder and faster and longer than ever before so they can still try to make their brick quota. But it's impossible. And maybe it was just kind of feeling like a cruel joke and then the beatings start. Who are they going to blame? Of course they're going to blame Moses and Aaron. They confront them and they put the whole mess at their feet, saying that it's them who put the sword in Pharaoh's hands. You can't blame them, can you? If you're an Israelite, every part of their reaction makes perfect sense, except maybe the fact that they actually got their hopes up in the first place. Because the Hebrews didn't really know or trust their God, they do what seems reasonable to them in the moment. They make the self-protective choice in the moment to blame their new leaders and give up. What other choice do they have? Now let's turn and think about this story from the perspective of Moses. And remember, Moses didn't want to do this in the first place. Not only did he not volunteer to do this, but when he got chosen, he tries to dodge the whole draft that God is putting on him. He never thought he was qualified or able. So now as everything goes south and the bruised and bloodied new friends that he's made when he comes back who trusted him, get up in his face and blame him, how is he going to feel? He's going to feel angry, bitter, frustrated, scared, helpless, like a failure, like he's been left out to dry by God. So Moses turns to God and he says, oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. Let's start with the good part of this. There are some glimmers of hope in Moses' reaction here. In his pain and in his, this horrible situation, Moses turns to God. Uh, he did the right thing by turning to God. He went to the right place. This is good. Moses knows that God, he knows God enough to know that this is the only place that he has to turn. The other thing that he gets right is that he still correctly believes that God is sovereign, that God is in control. God has not lost control of the situation, and Moses seems to get that. The bad news is that he is attributing evil to God. The situation is, in fact, from God, and it is, in fact, painful, but because it's coming from God, it's not evil. In Moses' knowledge that God was behind their situation, Moses isn't turning to God in trust. He's blaming God, and he's accusing God. He's back to his old questioning of why God would even choose him. Moses can't seem to see beyond the moment. 
and believe that God might have bigger plans in the works. In fact, he seems to not be believing what God had explicitly told him. Back in chapter 4, just in last week's sermon, God had told Moses that Pharaoh would not initially let the people go and that things would escalate until the death of Pharaoh's firstborn son. And that's certainly not all the details of the story, but it seems like it's enough to know that there's going to be trouble <laughs> as he goes to Pharaoh and asks for things to be set right. Moses should have been expecting hardship if he was listening to and believing what God had told him when he was back in Midian. So just like Pharaoh and the Israelites, much of Moses' reaction makes a lot of sense from a purely human level. It's very understandable. Moses certainly knew God a lot more than Pharaoh did, and even, it seems, more than the people of Israel did, but he clearly has a lot to learn still. He doesn't really trust God very consistently here. So when things get tough, he reverts back to old ways of thinking, and he too fails to trust the Lord with the hard turn that his life seems to be taking. And that gets us to the main lesson from this passage. Without a knowledge of God, you cannot trust God. And you're stuck being slaves to doing what seems reasonable in your own mind. Without a knowledge of God, you cannot trust God. And you're stuck being slaves to doing what seems reasonable in your own mind. That's essentially what Pharaoh said back at the beginning of our passage. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. He's right. He didn't know the Lord. So why or how could he ever obey him? He can't. And he won't. Sadly, it's going to take a lot more demonstrations of God's power before Pharaoh will know enough about God to be able to relent and let his people go. Not trusting God, but trusting what they can see in the moment. Everyone in this story does what seems reasonable and self-protective in the moment. For Pharaoh, that meant giving them more work, trying to embitter them against their leaders. For Israel, that meant blaming Moses and Aaron. And for Moses and Aaron, it meant blaming God. But we don't have to be slaves to that. If we actually know the Lord, we can trust the Lord when life gets hard. And that's the application that I think we ought to take from this story and this passage. Know the Lord so that you can trust the Lord when life gets hard. Because life is going to get hard. Someone is going to hurt you or betray you. Someone you love will get sick or they will die. That job that seemed like a blessing will become toilsome labor. Something you long for will remain out of reach. Someone you love or something you love will be taken from you. Your body will break down there will be times that you will be tempted to give up. Being a Christian does not make you immune from any of those or all the other heartbreaking things I could have put in that list. The way that you need to be preparing for those hard things is growing in your knowledge of the Lord. So that when those things come, you'll be ready. You'll be prepared. You need to grow in the knowledge that God is in control. So that you're protected from the lie that says that he is powerless. Or that he is a bystander. You need to grow in the knowledge that he is good. So that you're protected from the lie that he would ever do evil to you. 
You need to grow in the knowledge that he knows what is best so you're protected from the lie that your plan is better. You need to grow in the knowledge that he is with you so you're protected from the lie that you could ever be abandoned. You need to grow in the knowledge that he is true so you're protected from the lie that he could ever deceive you. You need to grow in the knowledge that he is better so you're protected from the lie that anything this world could offer you would ever be able to satisfy you. Growing in the knowledge of these things and so many others will set a foundation so that when the hard things come, you'll be able to withstand the blows that they bring into your life. How do you grow in that knowledge? What you're doing right now is part of the answer, right? Being a part of church, being with God's people, being in God's word. Do those things with consistency, and with intentionality. Be in a core community. Be in a small group Bible study. Come to Sunday school class. Hop in a life group. Go to the prayer meetings that are offered. By being intentional with the conversations that you have over meals with believers and walks that you take or the people you work with, by spending time in the word on your own each day. As you read good books and listen to good sermons and good podcasts, all of those things are making deposits into your life to grow your knowledge of what is true so that when the hard things come and the lies are tempting to believe, you have a foundation that you can stand under. It's, many of you know uh, that six years ago our son died and I'm regularly, well not regularly, it's not uncommon for people to ask how did you, how did you survive, how did your faith make it and honestly this is the answer. I spent whatever that would have been, 20, 25 years of growing in my knowledge of who God is. So that when the hardest thing I could ever imagine came, it didn't throw me off the ship. Like I stood and God sustained me through it. I remember about a month afterwards, um, the church that we were at before, the Stratford Park Bible Chapel, um, one of the staff there sent me an excerpt from a sermon that I had given back in 2012. Uh, from the book of Galatians and it was talking about expect hardship in your life and I had preached that and needed to hear it for myself again and it was such a blessing when he sent that to me as a reminder that God had been building into me beliefs and foundational truths about who he was and what it looked like to walk with him so that when the most horrible thing that I could ever imagine came into my life, it didn't, it didn't kill me. <laughs> I'm still trusting Jesus. I'm still walking with him. And that's my hope for us is that we're reminded this morning of our need to dig deeply into his word and with his people to grow a foundation so that as life comes at us hard, we don't make what seems reasonable choices to us in the moment. But unreasonably, we trust the one who has us and who will never let us go, who is good, who is sovereign, who cares for us more deeply than we can ever fathom. In one sense, this is a story about bricks and straw. But in another sense, this is really a story about the sovereignty and power of God and our ability to trust him when life gets hard. Pharaoh demanded bricks and didn't give him straw. We experience that in different ways, right? Maybe it's a tyrannical boss and it feels like a one-to-one correlation, but 
Often it's more metaphorical than that, right? Life demands that we need to do more, that we need to be more, that we need to have more, and we sit under crushing expectations that the world puts on us or that we put on ourselves even. But we see what we serve, a risen and sovereign Lord who says what we looked at in our call to worship, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Know him so you can put your trust in him when life gets hard. Let me pray. God, you are sovereign and good, and we can trust you. Lord, I pray that in the coming days and months and years, their knowledge of you would grow. You would grow within us a baseline of trust that will carry us through every hard thing that comes our way. Not because we're so strong, but we're trusting in one who is so strong. We trust you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.